Yesterday, I tried to make a Magnus Carlsen video, and I recorded all of it, except for the fact that it didn't have audio. Are you kidding me? And that really sucks. However, I still think it's a game that you guys should take a look at, and so I'm gonna re-record this entire thing, just that way you guys can see it, because it's worth it. Stick around. So with all that being said, let's try this one more time. Magnus Carlsen makes the game of chess look easy, and I'm going to show you exactly how he does it. And of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games into the future, click on the subscribe button down below. We are a growing channel, we are almost at 100 subscribers, and you can help us get there. With all of that being said, let's jump right into the game. Alright, so in this game we have Magnum Carlsbad, aka Magnus Carlsen, playing with the white pieces. And with the black pieces, we've got a guy by the name of Joran, or Yoran, or Yoran, I'm not totally sure. Either way, I'm just gonna call him the Roadrunner. <laughs> this guy's actually a Fide Master, and I'll leave his Fide profile in the description down below. In any event, the game begins with the moves d4 and knight to f6, an Indian game. And we're gonna transpose very quickly, um, so I'm not gonna go through all of the ideas. We have the move c4 from Magnus, looking to get some additional central control in the center of the board. And now we have the move e6 from the Roadrunner. And there's a lot of different things that can happen from here. Potentially, we'll see a Queen's Gambit declined. If the Knight comes out to the c3 square, we could see a Nimso Indian. But Magnus decides that he doesn't really want to play against the Nimso. He plays the move Knight to f3. And the entire point is so that way he doesn't have to play against the Nimso Indian. In any event, we now have the move B6, a favorite of one Levy Rosman, aka Gotham Chess, aka the Rosmanian Devil. And usually you see the Bishop Fianchettoing onto the long diagonal, that is the entire point, and potentially building up for future movement with the D-pawn or the C-pawn. So, with all of that being said, we now have the move G3 for Magnus, looking to counter the Fianchettoing of the light squared Bishop with Fianchettoing his own light squared bishop, and now we have the bishops Fianchettoing. We have bishop to b7 and bishop to g2. And now we have a very interesting move, bishop to b4 with a check, delivering a check onto the king and asking essentially what do you want to put in front of the king, because you're probably not going to be moving your king over to the f1 square, because if you do that, this rook will be lonely forever, unless of course you start some bizarre kingside attack. Nevertheless, we have the move bishop to d2, and now instead of trading off the bishops, we have the bishop going back to the e7 square, and this is called the Queen's Indian Defense Fianchetto Capablanca Ruiman variation, which is a ridiculous long name, but I do want to tell you a little bit about this guy, Ruiman. Nikolai Ruiman was born September 5th, 1908 in Moscow, Russia. And he was one of the strongest Russians in the 1930s. He was actually a three-time Moscow City champion, the years 1931, 1933, and 34, and the year 1935. 33-34 was like a combined year. In any event, he came second in the 1931 USSR Championship after Mikhail Botvinnik. Of course, Mikhail Botvinnik would eventually become world chess champion himself in 1948. And his name is mainly connected these days to the Queen's Indian Defense, the opening that we're looking at now. And he died in 1942 in Omsk, I believe that's how you pronounce that, uh, which is located right here. So a pretty interesting guy, and certainly one that you should know about. In any event, the game continues with castling for both players. We have castles from Magnus and castles from the Roadrunner. Now that Magnus's king is out of the center of the board, he now finally decides that he's going to develop his knight to the c3 square. And you're not really worried about any Nimso Indian stuff because, first of all, you would just be moving your bishop back and forth, which would make no sense. Of course, back over here, the bishop just moved out and then moved back, so why you would now bring it back forward would make no sense. So we now have instead the move d6, and now here in this position we're potentially looking for expansion with the c-pawn. Here Magnus makes his first inaccuracy, and that is with the move bishop to g5, and the reason why this is an inaccuracy is for two reasons. First of all, you're moving your bishop again. The second reason why it's inaccurate is because clearly we want this pawn moving forward or this pawn moving forward. You can prevent that by playing the move d5 here. And the idea is that if they just simply push, well, congratulations, you've blocked out this bishop for the rest of the game and you can begin your own attack. And if they take, then you don't actually want to snap take back. Instead, you would play this move if you were Magnus, which is the knight jumping into the d4 square. And now the bishop opens up with the pawn 
Sorry. Do not be sorry. Be better. With the pawn and the knight onto that d5 square. And of course, the pawn cannot take because if the pawn tries to take, then all of a sudden these bishops would open up and you would lose your bishop for no reason. So instead of seeing that, um, we have the move bishop to g5, and that's why it is slightly inaccurate and pretty much it makes everything equal. Of course, you do not want to leave this bishop here forever. You would like to move your knight or your bishop out of the way eventually. And so in order to move that around, we have the move h6, asking this bishop what it's doing. And now the question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to back the bishop up again, all the way back down to the d2 squared? That seems kind of ridiculous. And so in this position, instead of doing that, Magnus now takes on f6, and now the bishop takes on f6. Now it should be noted here that the roadrunner does have the bishop pair, while Magnus has the two knights. So there's quite a bit of imbalance in terms of material. Magnus now brings his queen up to the d3 square. His rooks are now connected very beautifully on this first rank, and there is a very sneaky idea that Magnus has. And after the move knight to d7, that idea comes to fruition. And as you can see from the evaluation bar, it's now plus 0.8. And the reason why is you could play this unbelievable move, knight to g5, and you are threatening checkmate. And of course, with the knight and the queen, but also look at these bishops. They're now opened up to each other and you might potentially lose one of your bishops and we could have an equality of material. We now have bishop takes on g5 and now bishop takes on b7. And now the material is back to being equal. We've traded one of our knights for the bishop. And now if we look at the position, we have opposite colored bishops, one knight, a queen for each player, and the two rooks. And of course, everybody still has eight pawns on the board. And what this means is that if we trade off everything else except the light squared and the dark squared bishop, then that is most likely going to be a draw in most positions. Now, the Roadrunner here just simply plays the move rook to b8. Of course, his rook was being targeted in the corner of the board by the bishop. I'm pretty sure that was obvious to everybody who's not like 200 elo. So after the bishop is attacked on b8, we now have the move bishop back to g2, just simply retreating. Here we have the move bishop to f6, looking to target this pawn once again. And now Magnus goes on the attack. He plays the move knight to b5, and he's looking at coming in down over here. You cannot simply move your rook back because if you do, then of course this bishop can always gobble it up. Here we have the move a6, looking to kick out this knight. Now, most people who are lower rated would probably just retreat back and say, oh, well, now your uh, queen side is a little bit weaker, but not Magnus. Magnus says, my idea was not to take this pawn. My idea was to jump into the position to a7, and the idea is that Magnus is going to reroute his knight back to the c6 square, which is being defended currently by the bishop, and fork both your rook and your queen. That is the idea behind this move, knight to b5. That was the entire point of knight to b5. And now, after the knight is in here, you can't even go over here because you will be taken by the bishop. Or will you? Because now we have to move rook to a8. And the bishop is not going to take because this bishop is significantly more powerful than this rook. This rook isn't doing anything. First of all, look at all of these pieces. These pieces are completely stuck behind the third rank. It is not moved forward. Magnus has extraordinary pressure on the position. And not only that, which is that after you take this rook... Then the queen comes over, and then this knight is completely stuck. It has no escape, because it can't escape back out this way, because then the queen will be over here on the a8 square, and it cannot escape that way because it will be taken. Here, I'll show you what I mean. If you take the rook, then the queen takes, and you cannot escape this way, because, of course, the queen on a1 takes away that square for the knight, and the knight obviously can't go back out this way, so you would lose your bishop and your knight and control of this beautiful long diagonal, um, not like that, this beautiful long diagonal, if you were to do something like that. Consequently, we don't have that. We instead have the move knight to c6 anyways, targeting the queen. And now the queen is open, and so the queen has to move out of the way over to the e8 square. And again, look at the negation of all of the material 
for Magnus's opponent. And Magnus just keeps pushing forward. He plays the move b4, and Magnus's opponent tries to get out by playing the move a5, but this is a severe blunder, and it is not pushing forward, believe it or not. You do not actually want to push forward in this position because that would close down lines for your rooks to get involved into the game. You want to bring your rooks out. You want to bring the rook on the a1 square to the b8 one square, and you want to bring the rook over to the c1 square, and you're just going to rip everything open. Nevertheless, we have b takes a5 and b takes a5, and now all Magnus has to do is play the move rook a to b1, and now he has control of this beautiful open file, and this bishop is no longer pressuring on this diagonal because the pawn can always move up now, and you don't have to worry about your rook hanging. So, with all of that being said, we have knight to b6, looking to reroute and add some additional pressure, and also close down the open file for Magnus. However, Magnus is not interested in any of this. He's just simply going to play rook f to c1, and his idea is he's just going to push forward. That's the whole idea, and he's going to reopen the center of the board. We now have the move queen to d7, looking to try and control everything. However, Magnus is able to simply play the move c5, and that is good enough. And of course, you can even take the pawn. That's perfectly fine. But then the rook just comes up. And remember, this knight does a great job of defending backwards. And so even though the queen... So for example, after pawn takes, uh, rook takes, even though the queen and the bishop are lined up on this pawn, you may think, oh, I can, can't can I just take it? No, you can't because this knight does backwards defense. Remember, knights can go backwards. And so now we have the move. Instead of that, we have the knight now moving out of the way to the d5 square, trying to rotate in. And it should be noted that by playing this move, you are blocking the bishop's line of sight to the knight. And so you have to open the line back up in order to be able to see that knight. And so we have c takes on d5. And now the rook is lined up and looking at, if I could draw an arrow, is line. Oh my gosh. What are you doing? And now the rook is lined up onto the knight. And so now the queen can no longer take. And the best thing for you to do is actually to take back with the pawn. Keep your pawns together. Do not create a pawn island. However, the roadrunner is clearly scared of Magnus having dominant control on these open files and is nervous about these rooks coming down. Consequently, he plays the move queen takes on d6. Oh, that is a terrible move. And now after the move e4, Magnus is looking to fork both the queen and the bishop. And if you do not move this knight out of the way, Magnus will just simply take it. So you've got all kinds of problems in this position. So the knight moves out of the way to the b4 square, which does target Magnus's queen. But again, the knight goes backwards. The knight can play backwards defense and plays knight takes on b4. And after a takes on b4, you are not worried at all about this singular pawn. This pawn means nothing. It is completely meaningless in this position. And so now Magnus plays a fantastic move. He plays the move e5. And this is a great move because not only are you forking both the bishop and the queen, but look who opens up. This bishop is now lined up on this diagonal. And after bishop takes on e5, of course, you cannot take back because of the pin on the pawn. We now have bishop takes on a6. And if you take back with the rook, then all Magnus needs to do is play this quiet move. Queen to e4. And now targeting both this uh, bishop with the pawn and the queen. Like so. And also targeting the rook in the corner of the board. In any event, we don't see that. We see instead bishop takes on d4 trying to go for tactics. All Magnus needs to do is play the move rook to d1. And now the bishop and the queen are lined up. You cannot take the bishop back because if you do, you will lose this bishop. And then Magnus would simply be up a rook. And if you simply back up, then Magnus would trade off the queens and bring his bishop back, and you would simply be up material in that endgame, and pretty much in all endgames, and Magnus would, of course, go on to win. The only thing you would have to kind of potentially worry about is if these two pawns get close, but Magnus would be able to stop that way before that happens. So, with all of that being said, in this position... Magnus Carlsen's opponent, the Roadrunner, resigns. So as you can tell, Magnus Carlsen just makes the game of chess look easy. His understanding of the positions and being able to just maneuver around is unbelievable. He is extremely good 
at identifying tactics. And of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games into the future, click on the subscribe button down below. It really helps us out. And of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games right now, click on the playlist, which is floating somewhere up here. And I hope you enjoyed the game of chess. Hope to see you in the next video. Take care.